Welcome to the online ministry of Park Street Baptist Church of Peterborough, Ontario, Canada. We wish you could attend in person, but trust that God will bless you through the music and the study of His Word. Thank you for joining us. At the Passover celebration before his crucifixion, Jesus took the bread and the cup and instituted the Lord's Supper for believers. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 11 that we celebrate the Lord's Supper to remember and proclaim his death. In Matthew 28, Jesus told the apostles to baptize new believers. Among other things, baptism symbolizes the cleansing as we go from Sin, the sinful life that we've repented of to new life in Jesus Christ. But what else should believers do? How are we to grow in our faith? This morning we'll think about the Word of God, about music, about prayer, and about meeting together, using only a few of the many scriptures that are available. Let's begin with the Word of God. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Paul wrote that our faith comes from hearing the word about Jesus, which we find in the New Testament. We believe certain facts about sin, about salvation, about Jesus, and we put our faith or trust in him. And those facts we learn through God's word, whether we hear it or read it for ourselves. And so the source of our faith is the Word of God. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. 
The sacred writings are the Old Testament, which points towards the Messiah, the Christ, Jesus. Now at that time, the New Testament had not yet been completed. But the New Testament writings also became sacred or holy, especially since they explained Jesus and his new covenant to us. Notice that Paul mentioned how Timothy had learned the scripture, the sacred writings, from childhood. He was well acquainted with the Old Testament scripture. Like Timothy, we are learning the scripture. Every time we read the Bible, every time we listen to a sermon, we're learning the scripture. Paul continued, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Paul described all scripture as God-breathed or inspired by God. God breathed life into his creatures, and similarly he has breathed life into his word. It's powerful and strong. It's profitable. It's worth our time. Paul was explaining to Timothy, whom he was mentoring, the importance of God's word in the life of the people who minister for Jesus. However, his word is important for us all. He gave Timothy some reasons why the Old Testament is profitable or useful, which apply even more to the New Testament. It's useful for teaching, for teaching us who God is and what he expects of us. It's useful for reproving us about our bad conduct. It's useful for correcting us about our false beliefs. And it's useful for training us in righteous conduct. Let's now look at a very poetic way of explaining the value of Scripture. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. In this psalm, David describes Scripture as the law of the Lord, as the testimony of the Lord, as the precepts of the Lord, as the commandment of the Lord, and as the rules of the Lord. And he describes the value of Scripture, the importance of Scripture, using these words, which apply to the New Testament as well. Perfect, sure, right, pure, true, and righteous. So what did Jesus say about the Word of God? Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting forty days and forty nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus was responding to a particular temptation by Satan. Satan was encouraging him to indulge his physical hunger. But Jesus answered by quoting the Old Testament. First, that the Word of God is important to us spiritually in the way that food is important to us physically. If we want to grow spiritually, we need God's Word. And second, we learn from Jesus to use Scripture when dealing with the temptation to sin. We're not strong enough on our own to conquer temptation. We need the Word of God. 
and the power of his spirit. But there's more. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. Paul wrote that scripture was written for the instruction of those who first read his letter. But this is true for us too. And notice that we have hope through the encouragement of scripture. And we all need hope for now and for eternity. And so we look to the scripture to encourage us. And the scripture has power. In Hebrews we read, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And in Ephesians we read, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. The writer to the letter of the Hebrews describes Scripture as a sword. Now in Hebrews it might be God himself who is wielding the sword to penetrate right to our thoughts and intentions, teaching our consciences or pricking our consciences, as the case may be. Writing to the Ephesians, Paul describes us as warriors in the kingdom of God, who are to use the word of God as the sword of the Spirit. It's useful for defending ourselves against the attack, the attack of Satan and his hosts. And we can use it against temptation, of course, but also against the human enemies of the gospel. We need to become skilled in the use of this particular weapon, That won't happen by leaving it in its scabbard. That won't happen by displaying it on a shelf. It's only useful if we use it, if we read it and study it, if we learn and live it. This morning it was my privilege to baptize a new convert. Jesus said, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We did that this morning. And Jesus continued, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Before ascending into heaven, Jesus told the apostles to make disciples of all nations and to baptize them, and then to teach the new disciples. They were to... They were to teach them to observe or obey what Jesus had commanded. And the only way to know what he commanded is to read the scripture. Speaking to one of the leaders and teachers in the early church, Paul wrote, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Paul's concern here was that Timothy would do his best to handle the word of truth rightly or correctly. This means knowing and explaining the scripture so that others would understand what it truly means. Now because we're so far away in time and in culture, it's more difficult for us to understand rightly and to teach it rightly. And some of it was already difficult to understand even when it was written. Peter wrote, And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them about these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. According to Peter, some things that Paul wrote were difficult to understand. They required some work, some thought. Although Peter easily understood the words and the culture, he realized that understanding the spiritual meanings was a challenge sometimes. And those who didn't understand sometimes made up their own meanings. 
And by the way, notice that when Peter compared Paul's writing to other scriptures, he was in effect saying that Paul's writings were scripture. Peter also wrote, But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you'll be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. Peter knew that there was a serious risk of persecution of believers. In fact, it seems he expected it. But he told them not to be afraid, but to be ready to defend their faith to those who wonder why we believe what we believe, why we have hope in this world. We will find that we are in situations where we need to defend our faith, either to explain the gospel to believers or to defend the gospel against unbelievers. And we won't be able to explain or defend what we haven't studied and understood. In Acts 17, Luke wrote about an event in one of Paul's missionary journeys. The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now, these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Many of them therefore believed, with not a few Greek women of high standing, as well as men. The Jews in the synagogue in Berea weren't even believers at first. But Luke commended them for checking the scriptures to see if what Paul and Silas taught them fit with scripture. And because they checked the scripture, many of them believed in Jesus. I think there are two lessons here. First, we who are preaching the gospel must be careful to stick with Scripture. We need to stick to the Bible. We're not here to preach the latest philosophy or ideology or scientific theory or political movement. And second, we have to check what we're being taught against the Scripture. We live in a world in which there are many false teachings, even among those who call themselves Christians. And the answer is to check the scripture to see if these things are so. Now what about meditation? Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Be careful. Meditation used to mean pondering over some thought or idea. And so meditating in the Bible means thinking about or pondering over something that we learn from Scripture, something about the character of God or the wonder of our salvation something about how we should live as the people of God. Watch out for Eastern meditation, which has begun to contaminate the thinking even of some Christians. It has to do with emptying your mind of thought. It may include mindless or unthinking repetition. And these are open invitations to Satan to enter and fill your mind. Christian meditation has content to it. We meditate about something that we learn from the Bible. We ponder something, and we relate that to other scriptures that we know. And we think about how to apply it to our lives, and we meditate on how wonderful our God is. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. As we allow the word 
to dwell or live in us, we're to teach and admonish one another. So in addition to the formal Bible teaching of the elders, pastors, and other leaders of the church, believers are to share what they have learned with each other. And furthermore, we're to admonish each other. If a fellow believer is not acting righteously, we're to speak to him or her. Now, those who aren't elders or overseers would not have the official authority of the church, but they would have the authority of God's word. Admonishing each other won't be easy. It's hard enough to hear a preacher speak about our sin. It's much harder, I think, to have someone speak to us personally. But notice that this admonishing is based on the Bible. We don't have the license to criticize or admonish someone based on our personal feelings or our opinions. On the contrary, we must make sure that we have the scripture handled rightly to support what we say. Paul went on to speak about singing. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. When the word dwells in us richly, we will also sing with thankful hearts to God. Paul wrote here about singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And this is the way it struck me. Some have lyrics taken from the Bible. Some are slow and profound. And some have rhythm and repetition. There's a variety in Christian music. It flows out of the word and out of our thankful hearts. And Paul wrote something similar to the Ephesians. Be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice again, there are at least three types of music. Those with lyrics from the Word of God, those which express our awe and wonder toward God, and those that make us want to tap our toes. When we sing, we're not just singing for each other. We're expressing our thoughts and feelings towards God. Well, that also includes prayer. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. Writing to the Ephesians, Paul wrote that they are to be praying at all times. I take this to mean not just at certain times of the day or when we're in church, Rather, we're to talk with God anytime. Think of it this way. God speaks to us through his written word, the Bible. We speak to him in singing, but especially in prayer. And since prayer is communication, we can even express to God our unhappiness or our frustration. And since we're much like other people down through the centuries, let's not be surprised when God's response is already in his word. To the Philippians, Paul wrote more about prayer and supplication. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Instead of being anxious or worrying, Paul wrote that they were to pray and tell God their requests. This word supplication means asking or even begging God to act. Prayer is an important part of our spiritual growth. But our final thought is about meeting together with other believers. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. When we meet together, we have the opportunity to stir each other up to love. 
the kind of love that causes us to do good works for each other. And we also have the opportunity to encourage each other. I think our attitude of love and our good works would also be encouraging. About those who only come to church occasionally or intermittently, I have to wonder, do they have a good reason or is it just an excuse? According to Hebrews, we should be meeting together. So, are we reading and studying and meditating on the Bible? Are we responding to God in music and in prayer? Are we meeting regularly with fellow believers who can stir us up to love and good works and encourage us? These are important for all believers, not just new believers, all of us. Let us pray. Father, help us to take these verses to heart. Help us to live what we learn. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This is Pastor David Richardson again. Thank you for listening to this YouTube version of our Sunday service. We would be delighted to have you join our Sunday services in person. The sermons are live versions of what you've just heard, usually verse-by-verse -verse teaching from the Bible. Our live worship is much more dynamic in person. It is thoughtfully and prayerfully planned and led by our worship leader, Sylvie Copland, with the help of our praise team. Please consider this your invitation to join us, if you are able. Thank you.